Let's give God some praise in the house. He will never fail you. He will never fail you. People will fail you. Your wife will fail you. Your kids will fail you. Your friends will fail you. Your finances will fail you. But he will never fail you. Come on, let's give God some praise for being in the house on Sunday, packed house. Give your neighbor a high five. You made it to the house of God. I'm believing today that that God's going to give us an impartation of, of the gospel and give us new revelation. And everybody stay, stay standing. We're going to pray real quick. Sorry, guys. But we did it for first service. Um, as we pray, I want us to lift up all of our unsaved family members. If you're a mom and you've been burdened by your son or your daughter, they've been out there in the world. We want to lift them up any aunts, any cousin, maybe it could be your mom. You've been serving the Lord, and your mom, she's not serving the Lord. We want to lift up your mom. We want to lift up your dad. We want to lift up your family members. Can we do that right now? Everybody raise their hand as a sign of surrender. And as I pray, I want you to pray. As I make a petition, I want you to make a petition right now. Lift up your family member right where you're at, your son, your daughter, your sister, your brother, you know who they are. It might be a burden. You might have been crying for them. You might have been on your knees already. You've been pleading to God that the, your, that the mercy of the Lord and the grace of the Lord would just reach them. Right now, Father God, as everybody's lifting up, Father, I come in an agreement with every man of God and every woman of God in this house. Lord Jesus, there's a war, Father, and there's a fight, Father. And Father God, our family members, they're being tormented. They're broken. They're confused. And right now, Father, we just lift them up to you right now, Father. You know them by name, Lord. And we just pray, Lord, right now in the name of Jesus, Lord, that the spirit of addiction would be broken over their lives, Father. That the spirit of suicide would be broken over their lives, Father. That the spirit of depression that's been keeping them bound, that's been keeping them back, that the spirit of depression would be broken over their lives lord lord if it's a son if it's a daughter if it's a mom it's a dad lord hear our hearts right now lord lord jesus only you could reach them only you could save them so do the impossible our lord we leave every burden to you right now, Father, because these people, it's, it may be a burden, Lord. It may be some, but something that's been weighing us down. But right now, Father, we release the burden to you. We release the worry to you. We release the pain to you. We release the anxiety to you. We release everything to you right now, Lord. We come boldly to your throne of grace and we lay it at your feet. Father God, do what only you could do, Lord for our unsaved family members. We love you, Lord, and we thank you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say amen. Let's give God some praise. Give God some praise. He's doing something in your family's life. He's doing something in your son's life, in your daughter's life. Keep praying. Keep making that petition. The Lord is always on time. Amen? Look at your neighbor, give him a high five, give him a dab, give him a hug. Let him know you're in the right place to be. It's a packed house. Give yourself a round of applause for showing up. It's, it's been a rainy weekend. I saw a meme like a couple weeks ago. It said, I could do all things through Christ, but it rain, when it rains, you stay home. You don't go to church. You stay home from church when it rains. I saw that meme. I was like, hey, that's true. When it rains, it's just easy to stay home, right? But um, we just finished up our discipleship series, and we are today launching the gospel series. Amen? And why are we introducing this series? We know four weeks away, we're from, we're, we're going to have Resurrection Sunday, Easter Sunday, and for some strange reason, people will only come to church on Easter, Right? So let's take advantage to invite, invite, invite so that they could hear a message that's going to change and save their life. Because there's a lot of people in here, 
we're a byproduct of that message. Like that message is the reason why we're saved and that's the reason why we are plugged in. That's the reason why we're being discipled, amen? Because we heard a message, right? We heard a message that met us in our brokenness. We heard a message that met us in our mess, that met us when we were doing the craziest stupid things, but God saw us and you couldn't help yourself, so he sent his son to search and rescue you. And sometimes we get saved and we get polished, we forgot what it was like to be lost and broken. You used to be lost and broken, so you should be able to reach lost and broken people because that used to be you, amen? So everybody say, the gospel. The gospel. Good, news. good news. Anybody need some good news today? Somebody say amen. amen. So the gospel is exactly that. It's good news. Good news. And to appreciate the good news you gotta know about the bad news. And the bad news is that for all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We all have sin, and the price of sin is death, right? But, Christ, but God sent his son on a search and rescue mission. Jesus Christ was like love invading the earth. And think about that, like, when you were in a lost condition and you were satisfying every craving that sin had to offer, like he saw you in that place, in that condition, and he knew he could, you couldn't save yourself, so he sent his son to rescue you, to redeem you, and to spare you from the penalty of sin and the power of sin, and you didn't have to face the wrath of God. That's good news, amen? Because I, 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 I'm, I'm in the streets all the time, and I, and I hear people when I, when I see people, everybody wears the cross. But you need to get revelation of the cross so that the cross could have real meaning to you. It's not just a good luck charm. Right? Because we wear it like it's a fashion statement. But I pray today that as we go through this gospel series, that there would be urgency to invite. There would be urgency to share the message that saved you. And the gospel is a simple one plus one equals two. It's not like a geometry problem. Like we, we're the ones that make it difficult. No, open your mouth and let the Holy Spirit speak. Get beside yourself. And it's God that does the saving. It's your responsibility to share. You can't save them, only he can save them, amen? So point one, if we don't preach the gospel, how could they receive the gospel? And the, the famous Great Commission scripture, Mark 16, 15, Mark says, go into the world, go into the world and preach the gospel. It doesn't say wait for the world to come to you. It doesn't say wait for a perfect circumstance or a perfect condition. No, it's saying you go into the world, you go to the dark place, you go into the hood, and you preach the gospel. Thank God for our adopter block team, amen? Thank God for our adopter block team, amen? Come on. So the gospel, and when you share the gospel, there's only two options. They could either receive it or reject it. Receive it or reject it. And the gospel is what? It's a message of hope. It's a message of grace. Anybody need any hope today? Anybody need any grace today? The gospel is a message of sacrifice. It's a message of redemption, restoration, reconciliation. The gospel is God's rescue plan for humanity. You couldn't help yourself or save yourself, so God sent his son on a once-in-a-lifetime mission. The gospel is unconditional love invading the world through Jesus. Somebody say amen. amen. When I think of the gospel, I think of God's unconditional love extending itself to us at our lowest point. When I think of the gospel, I think of peace because apart from God, 
we're at war with God. Because apart from God, we're practicing sin. And when you practice sin, you are in direct rebellion against God. That makes you an enemy of God. But through the gospel, we could have peace with God. That's peace. And when I think of the gospel, I think about Jesus who was perfect, he was blameless, he was spotless. The Bible says that he never sinned and he never even thought or perceived evil or bad. But yet he died for the undeserving sinner to spare us from the penalty of sin and the wrath of God. When I think of that, that should give you joy. When I think of the gospel, man, I think of freedom. Freedom. Like some of us were bound. Some of us were broken. Some of us didn't even know what to do, but we heard a message that could change and save our life, and now we're free from the power of sin, the bondage of sin, and we're free from the penalty of sin through the cross, amen? The gospel, it's the power of God unto salvation. Somebody say power. Power. Like this is a message packed with power. I think of Romans 1.16 when the Apostle Paul says, for I am unashamed, meaning you shouldn't be shy, you shouldn't be timid, you should be bold to preach a message that saved you. Like, think about how broken you were. Think about all the crazy relationships that you were in. Think about all the crazy people you wanted to be with. I'm not talking about the church you. I'm talking about the real you. Because the church you is polished. The church you is polite. You're patient. But there's also another side of you that a lot of people don't know about. And that's why he died for you. Man. Now, there's a lot of different messages that we'll run to. There's a lot of messages that we like to put on. And some of us, like, we're quick to listen to a motivational message. Like, that'll be like our first option. I wanna listen to a motivational message, get my day going. Or we'll we're like to listen to like, there's certain messages that you like listening to. You know what I'm talking about. Now, there's a message that'll get you through a tough season. There's a message that'll help change your perspective. And these messages are needed. And there's even messages that we'll pay for and invest in, like think rich to be rich. There's so many different messages in the world. But I want to ask you, what is the message that you are passionate about? Because there's all these messages, but there's only one message that could change and save a life. There's only one message that could change and save a life. And that message is why you're sitting in the seat, and that message is doing something to you right now. And there's only one message, and we know that message. That message is the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. Now, I got to remind everybody that Jesus actually came to reach sinners, because sometimes we could get put into a box and even the religious leaders at the time, like the Pharisees and the Sadducees, when they saw Jesus eating with sinners, they were pretty disappointed. They were pretty upset. And Jesus, how did he reach sinners? He sat with them. He talked to them. He listened to them. And yes, he preached and he taught, but I want to remind everybody, don't be afraid to talk to a sinner. Don't be too self-righteous because the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they thought they were saved already because of their self-righteousness. So sometimes there was an exclusivity with the church people of the day, and it kind of mirrors the model of the church today because sometimes we could be really ex exclusive, we could be really boxed in in who we want to talk to and who we want to welcome and who we want to invite because if they look a little dirty and if they smell a little different and they look a little different, we may not want to talk to them. 
We may not want to have a relationship with them. I know I'm talking at least one person in here. So, like Jesus ate with sinners, and you're probably saying, like, Drew, what Bible verse is that? I'm glad you asked. Matthew 9, 10 through 13. This is your scripture for Drew. When did he sit with a sinner? He didn't just sit with them. He ate with them. So let's go later, Matthew. This is Matthew 9, 10 through 13. Later, Matthew invited Jesus and his disciples to his home to be dinner guests, along with many tax collectors and other disreputable sinners. Like, these were the baddest sinners. And some of you guys used to be the baddest sinners, so don't look at me like that. You guys were bad. Some of you guys are still bad. But when the Pharisees saw this, they, the, the, the church people, these are, this is the church people of the New Testament, because I want to say the church people because we got church people in here today. They asked the disciples, why does your teacher eat with such scum? Now, you may have never said that, but I guarantee you probably have thought that. When Jesus heard this, he said, healthy people don't need a doctor. Sick people do. Then he added, now go and learn the meaning of the scripture. I want you to show mercy, not offer sacrifices. For I have come to call not those who think they are righteous, meaning I didn't come for the church people. I came for those who know they are sinners, and I came to call them to repentance. There's some church people that need to repent today for thinking that you're just better than the sinners. So, lost people need to hear this message. Why do lost people need to hear this message? Because we are called to reach the lost. Some of us only want to talk to church people. When's the last time you talked to a sinner? When's the last time you sat down with a sinner? When's the last time you listened to a sinner? I just gave you a scripture. Jesus was whining and dining with them. So share the message that saved you. Share the message that rescued you. Why wouldn't we share the message? Now, about 2015, I was doing adopt a block. Shout out to adopt a block, amen? So I'm over here at the Greyhound station. And the Greyhound station in San Bernardino is not the most nicest place. Behind the Greyhound station, there's prostitutes, there's drug dealers, there's killers, there's people walking around with guns. Sounds like the people Jesus sat with, right? So I'm walking, I'm behind the Greyhound station, and I meet a man named Robert. And Robert didn't smell good. Robert didn't look good. Robert looked busted and disgusted, beat up from the feet up. But I know when I was there, God sent me here to reach at least one person. So I met Robert, he's a shorter, shorter Mexican guy, and I looked at him in his eye, and I said, Robert! I said, I said, I believe that the power of God is going to set you free. And I believe that the power of God is going to invade your life and you will never be the same again. I believe the power of God is going to set you from every addiction, from every suicide. And I believe you're no longer going to be homeless anymore. And I said, do you believe that? He said, yes, I believe that. I said, are you ready to surrender your life to Jesus? Because this ain't going to work if you don't surrender. And Robert said, yes. So I prayed with him. I put my hand over his chest. I prayed. I just prayed for the power of God, the love of God to invade his life. And he repented that day, and he gave his life to the Lord. Amen? Amen. Now, how many of you know when you give your life to the Lord, that's just step one? You th the, the, he, you th did he change overnight? Absolutely not. So the next week... I actually picked them up. We actually ate at Sundowners here in San Bernardino. So we're at Sundowners. And he's in line. He said, Andrew, can I get the ribs? 
I said, get the ribs, man. Get whatever you want. So we sat down, and I said, Robert, how long have you been an alcoholic? He said, Andrew, I've been an alcoholic for 50 years. That's half a century. And when he said 50 years, I was like, my goodness, this is really going to take a move of God. This is going to really take, I was like, God, I, man, I need your help. So I'm listening to him. I'm just listening to him. And I said, well, you know, what led you to just be bound to alcohol? He said, when I was 15 years old, I lost my brother, who was my best friend, in a tragic car accident. And he said, since then, I just didn't know how to deal with it. He said, I've lost my family. I've lost and I burnt all my relationships. I lost my wife. I don't, my kids don't talk to me. And I'm, I'm just listening. I'm hearing them out. And, and while, we're, while I'm listening to them, we, we, you know, we're doing Bible studies. We're having, we're having a DG in 2015. And from there, I start bringing him to church. He start coming to Hallmark Campus. I think I, I brought him for like six weeks straight. Six weeks straight, drunk. Six weeks straight, asleep. Six weeks straight, I'm like trying to wake him up. I'm like, come on, man. You got you to gotta listen to the message, man. You're making me look bad. I was like, man, how's the power of God going to hit if this guy's asleep? So I'm like, man, God, this guy's, this guy's going to be tough. So, so I'm working with him. I'm listening to him. Next thing you know, I get him in a men's home. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. The guy leaves the men's home one week later. Like, Robert, what are you doing? He's like, oh, it didn't work out for me. I'm like, no, you just need to submit. He's like, no, I don't like that men's home. He, he said a lot of bad things. It, it wasn't our men's home, thank God. So anyway, I'm still bringing him to church. He's still drunk. He's, and mind you, like, I don't know how many bottles this guy has to drink, but I'm still believing in the power of God to touch his life. Amen? So next thing you know, he checks in to another men's home. I don't see him for maybe nine, 10 months. And I'm like kind of worried. I'm like, man, I ain't heard from this guy. Like, is he alive still? Like, you know, so I actually went to like, I actually went looking for him around Mount Vernon and I started asking some people like, hey man, have you seen Robert? And the people that I met, they actually said, no, he passed away, he died. And I was like, what? Like, like it really, it really bothered me. I was like, he died? So, so I thought he was dead. Next thing you know, I get a phone call like two weeks later, it's Robert. Robert's like, Andrew! I was like, Robert, I thought you were dead. Everybody told me in Mount Vernon that you died. He's like, no. He's like, I just graduated from a men's home, from a Christian men's home. And Robert says, I don't even drink anymore. And he said, and it's all your fault. So fast forward, because he's in L.A. So maybe about a couple years later, he actually came here, and Pastor Armando saw him in the parking lot, and he said, hey, 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 I'm looking for a guy named Andrew, and he was just like, oh, he goes to the Arrowhead campus, so he sent him to the Arrowhead campus, Roberto pulls up in a nice car, and I'm like, Roberto, is that you? Did you steal the car? He was like, no, I didn't steal the car. He said, I got a couple cars, and I got a couple houses, and I got a job for the union, and I'm like, I'm like, my goodness. So long story short, he was, he was bound to alcohol for 50 years, half a century. He came to the 9 a.m. service, but now, today, he's been alcohol-free for six years. He just moved to Colton, and now the Way World Outreach is his home church. Don't tell me that the power of God is it real. Give God some praise because there's another Roberto in your family that you are called to reach. The power of God is real. And I'm not going to lie. There were times where I wanted to just write him off. There were times where I was like, this guy ain't never going to get it together. I even brought him home one day, and my wife was like, who is this guy in our living room? <laughs> and I said, that's Roberto. He's part of the family. She was like, who is he related to? 
And I said, hey, honey, you come once. You're now part of the family, right? <laughs> Let's give God some praise. He was here for the 9 a.m. service. We all, man. And you know what's crazy? Like, we just, we just had our, shout out to my wife. She's right here, Sophia. Actually, my mother-in-law's here. And my mom's here. My stepdad's here. Let's give it up for them. They don't always get to come, but they came today. Um, we just had our third child, Sarai, and what, the coolest thing is that he found out we had a baby, and he actually came to the house and brought our daughter some gifts. And my, my wife was like, honey, like, Roberto's like a real friend now. And he's, you know, like, guys, I, I just share that because, you know, as we're embarking about, we're coming across Resurrection Sunday, there's a Roberto that's like so lost, 50 years bound to alcohol addiction. Everybody in his family wrote him off. But all it took was for me to share the gospel of Jesus Christ, for it's the power of God unto salvation. Let's give God some praise. So how can one get saved? Because we're talking about the gospel and the gospel is good news because the gospel gives people the opportunity to be forgiven of their sins and to have access to eternal life. Now, it's not just access to eternal life because I want to remind everybody, like when you receive Jesus, he gives you an abundant of life here on earth. An abundant of life is satisfying life. It's a life full of satisfaction and fulfillment. That gives you the purpose of life. When you have the purpose of life, you have the value of life. So it's like a double bonus. You get the abundance of life, your purpose in life, the value of life, and you get eternal life. Is that not good news? So how can one get saved? Putting your faith in Christ alone, recognizing that in you dwells no good thing, and you can't earn your way to heaven by your good works. Because I meet people all the time. I preach the gospel everywhere, on the airplane, at Walmart, everywhere. I don't care where I'm at. And the thing is, is the average person always says, it's because of my good works I'll get to heaven. No, good works don't cover up your bad works. Good works don't give an atonement for all the bad that you've done. There's only one thing that brings an atonement for your sin, and that's the work that was done on the cross. Amen? So you can't get your way into heaven by good works. You can only receive salvation when you know you're not good enough. And there's a godly, this is key right here, there's a godly sorrow within you because some of us receive salvation and there's no godly sorrow. Yeah. So there has to be a godly sorrow. You should feel sorry or grieve for what you've done. You sinned against a holy God and you offended him and you'd be guilty in the court of God's law. There's a godly sorrow within you for what you've done and you repent. Somebody say repent. Not the R word. And you repent and you cry out to be forgiven of your sins by the sheer grace of God based on the death and provision of Christ on the cross we are connected with God and empowered to be a force of good in this world. Somebody say amen. amen. You were empowered to preach. You are empowered to lay hands. You are empowered to cast out demons. You are empowered to heal the sick. You are empowered to preach the message that has all the resurrection power. Let us never be ashamed again. Amen. When I think about the gospel, I think about the cross. The cross has kind of become like a fashion statement. We wear it on a t-shirt. We wear it on our neck. We get it tattooed on us. Like I met a guy on, on a medical center Saturday morning. I, I wrecked his morning because he opened up the door. He had a fresh cross on his neck. And you know that was easy bait for me. I look at the cross and I say, I see you got the cross on your neck. 
He's like, oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. I got it when I was down. I was like, oh, yeah, how long were you down? Two years. I was like, I see you got the cross on your neck, but is it tattooed on your heart? And I said, you see, blood was spilled on that cross. He shed his life for you when you couldn't help yourself or save yourself. He saw the condition. He saw how broken you were. So he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven. You could, re you could be redeemed. And I said, hey, I laid my life down for that cross. And he looked at me and he said, <laughs> I just wrecked this Saturday morning. It's 10 a.m. on Medical Center, Westside San Bernardino. I wrecked this day. Did he receive? No, he didn't receive. But it's my responsibility to share. It's not my responsibility if they receive or reject it. I was in Redoso, New Mexico. Kid had the cross in his earring, and he was on the clock. He's lucky he was on the clock. I said, hey, bro, what, what, hey, what are the fun things to do in Redoso, New Mexico? And he said, hey, yeah, you can go over here. You can go get a tattoo. You can go over here. You can get high. And I looked at him, I said, oh, yeah? And he was like, yeah. I said, bro, I've been drug-free since 2011. I said, you want to know how? He said, how? I said, you see that cross that you're wearing on your earring? I said, the cross set me free from addiction. It set me free from being a weed smoker. It set me free from alcoholism. It set me free from depression, from suicide. It set me free from being a womanizer. And he's looking at me, he's like, yeah? I was like, bro, I laid down my life for that cross because he laid it down for me first. And he's lucky he was on the clock because for the next 15, 20 minutes, it would have been a whole preaching clinic in Walmart, altar call. <laughs> he's lucky that the clock saved him. So people will put, put on the cross as a fashion statement, but they refuse to pick up their cross when it comes to living for him or speaking for him. Like, when's the last time you shared the gospel? When's the last time you had compassion on a person like Robert, who was bound to alcoholism for 50 years? You probably walk by those people every day. Is there compassion? Is there a sense of urgency? I just want to remind ourselves that the church, we're here to reach the lost, and we can't just spend all our time reaching the church. Can the church people talk to sinners? There's a lot of sinners that they need to be saved, they need to be rescued, but God is waiting for the men and women of God in this house to share the message, the gospel of Jesus Christ, amen? So when I think of the gospel, I said this earlier, but I think about just unconditional love, but what happened on the cross was like the greatest demonstration and the greatest presentation of what unconditional love truly was. I think of John 15, 13, where Jesus says, and Jesus is basically saying, there's a lot of love on earth. There's a lot of love between humans and how we treat each other, but there's, there's only one form of the greatest love, and it's in here. John 15, 13 says, greater love has no one than this than to lay down one's life for his friends. So this is the greatest act of love. So Jesus called us friends when we were really enemies. Like, what do you mean, Drew? Like, when you were in sin, you were practicing sin. You were living a lifestyle of sin. You were living a lifestyle of rebellion against him, and you were offending a holy God. And even though you were an enemy, he saw past all the craziness, and he still saw you as friend through the lens of eternity and through the lens of you being redeemed and rescued. Amen? So let's go to Romans 5, 6 through 9. This is like my, one of my favorite gospel scriptures. For when we were still without strength, and in the NLT it says, for when you were utterly helpless... And when you were utterly helpless, think about the moment where you were just, you were just out there. You were cracked out, smoked out, and you, oh, I never did that, but you were in a crazy relationship. Oh, maybe you weren't in a crazy relationship, but you had hidden secrets that used to indulge in certain things behind closed doors that nobody saw, but God saw. So he saw you in that state and said, in due time, 
Christ died for the ungodly, meaning at just the perfect time, he came to rescue you. So it says, for scarcely for a righteous man will one die. And I'm going to stop right there because, you know, as husbands in here, some, I, want, I want to say all the husbands in here love their wife. Um, you'd probably die for your wife, right? How many husbands in here would die for their wife? Not a lot. Because it's saying in the scripture, you know, you would probably die for a righteous person, right? Wives. How many wives in here would die for their husbands? Okay, it's way better than first service. First service, I was looking at the faces of the wives, and man, I was pretty shocked. I was shocked that I was in church seeing this. So, so it says, in the next verse, it says, yet perhaps for a good man someone would even dare to die. So the greatest form of human love is that we would die for somebody that we love. We would die for somebody that means a lot to us. We would die for somebody that, you know, that we really, really value. And I know this, every hand should go up. Parents, you die for your children, right? Right? Because we love our children. So, so everybody in here could relate to the greatest form of human love. But... God's love is nothing compared to our, the greatest human love. Because it says, but God demonstrates his own love towards us in that while we were still sinners, while we were still in our mess, while we were still doing our thing, while we were still ignoring God, while we still didn't want God, and, and God used to send people to share to preach, and you would ignore them all the time. I know I did, because sin, man, I had fun in my sin. Anybody else have fun in their sin? I, I had a ball for a season, and then I had to face the, the, the consequences of sin, and that ain't fun, right? So he demonstrated his own love towards us, and that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. So he became the penalty of sin so that you didn't have to face the judgment of sin. Much more than having now been justified by his blood. Everybody say the blood. The blood. We shall be saved from the wrath through him. Somebody say amen. amen. So check this out. We live in a world full of liars, cheaters, gossipers, thieves, fornicators, adulterers, murderers, backstabbers. Like, man, this is a pretty hefty list. But when I think about this list, these are the people that Jesus ate and sat with. These are the people that he died for, not those who think they were self-righteous. Now, wait a second. You would lay down your life for your wife, or at least some of the husbands in here will. You would sacrifice your life for... For your husband, some of the wives in here will. You would for sure sacrifice your life for your kids. You might even lay down your life for your best friend, right? You got a best friend, I guarantee you take a bullet for your best friend. You might be willing to die for somebody that means a lot to you. We would die for the people that love us or for the people that we love the most. This wasn't the case for Jesus. When we were in sin, we didn't love Jesus. When we were in sin, we weren't even thinking about him. We were at our lowest point, satisfying every craving that sin had to offer. And maybe you haven't been there in a while, but you, I guarantee you once were. Jesus saw us in that condition. He loved us in that condition. He longed for us in that condition. He had compassion for us in that condition. And there was a deep desire within himself to restore us back to right standing. He died for people that didn't even love him. I pray you get a, man, because some of us know about the cross. Some of us know about the gospel. But you guys need to get revelation again. He died for people that didn't love him. He died for people that didn't deserve his love. We die for people that deserve our love. We die for people that love us. But that wasn't the case for him. The demonstration of God's love isn't displayed in that he died. It's displayed in who he died for. 
for undeserving sinners. This is, this is God's love. The definition of God's love is that he saw us at our worst, but he treated us as if we were at our best. If we looked at people a little differently, we would treat them like that too. Amen? Let's think of John 3, 16. For God so loved the world. And now everybody knows this scripture. But you need to get revelation of this scripture again because it's been five years, ten years since you shared the message that could change and save a life. For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only begotten son that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. So in that portion of scripture, God is extending three things. The first thing is God's love. For God so loved the world. So his love is being extended. It says, for God so loved the world that he gave. So he's extending God's gift. It says that whosoever believeth in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. That's God's offer. So to reject the gospel is to reject God's love, God's gift, and God's offer. That's a whole lot of rejecting for a person that really needs saving. Last point. Because we talked about preaching the gospel. And when you preach the gospel, you give up people the opportunity to receive it or reject it. So we're either receiving the gospel or rejecting the gospel, but what I wanna ask you guys today is, how are we responding to the gospel? Are we sharing the gospel? And are we living the gospel? Because if you ain't living the gospel, you, you're gonna ruin your own witness when it comes to sharing it, amen? So are we dying to ourselves? Are we dying to our own comfort? You know, and, and it's crazy because there's only a small portion of, of self-professed Christians that actually share the gospel. And I believe that the gospel message is a message that the world, like the devil is trying to silence this message from entering into the world. Like you gotta understand, like we have the solution. We have the answer. We have the message. Stop sleeping on the message. Stop underestimating the power in the message because this message has all the power to set the captives free. And this is the truth. The gospel that doesn't mention repentance is not the real gospel. Not the R word, Drew. Come on. Repentance is just simple. Turn away from self and turn to Christ. Let's go to Matthew 16, 24. Through 25. Then Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, if anyone desires to follow me, how many people in this house are following Jesus? Let's give God some praise. I just had to check. It's kind of quiet in here today, but if anyone desires to follow me, let him deny himself. So I got to stop right there. Why do we have to deny ourselves? We're talking about the core of you. Like the inner part of you. I'm not talking about you right now because you right now, you're real nice, you're real put together, you're real patient, you're real kind. But I'm talking about the inner you because you have a sinful nature. And when Jesus is saying deny himself, he says deny yourself, he's saying disobey yourself. Disobey yourself from what? Like self, man, self Self is evil. Self is greedy. Self is prideful. Yeah, you're a good person until somebody does something bad to you. How good of a person are, are you really? You're a good person. Let somebody press you. Let somebody offend you. Let somebody cut you off. How good of a person are you still? Let somebody take your seat. Are you still a good person? Or let somebody... Yeah, 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 take your seat. Man, man, there's a lot of seat taking in the house sometimes. And man, I see, I see, I see, I check the temperature. I see that look on your face. So you got to understand, because a lot, I see, because everybody says, pick up your cross. You see, the denying yourself part, that's you actually fighting and warring and resisting the devil. Because you can't die to self if you don't deny self first. 
Because we ever say, come as you are, come as you are. Yeah, come as you are. Die as you are. Die as you are. So the deny self is just disobeying yourself. And it means saying no to yourself. Like this is a violent no. This is an aggressive no. Think about all the times you were practicing sin and you kept practicing sin. I guarantee you, you never once said no. And since you don't say no, you always say yes. A silent no is an automatic yes. You don't say no. When you say no, you are speaking death over your flesh. That man, you need to kill that man, and that man needs to stay in the casket. Amen? So denying yourself is disobeying yourself. If your no to yourself isn't authentic, then your yes to God won't be real either. Yeah, you say yes to God in here, but you say yes to everything else out there. Yes, you come to God out here, but you go to everything else out there because there has to be a denying before you could actually die. It's a two-step process. Deny self, die to self. Let's, let's finish the screen. If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself take up his cross and follow me. For whoever desires to save his life will lose it, but whoever loses his life for my sake will find it, amen? So to deny means to restrain yourself from indulgence in pleasures. Hey, and we're talking about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. Hey, I guarantee you, you struggle with one of those three. Lust of the eyes, lust of the flesh, the pride of life. So taking up your cross means dying through a crucifixion process. So there's actually a process that one has to go through. So I'm gonna give you three quick P's on crucifixion. There's, a, there's so much to unpack and I'm just gonna go over it quickly. But remember, you have to die. You have to deny yourself. That means there's gonna be moments where the Holy Spirit is prompting you to share your faith and you're gonna probably be like, no, I don't wanna share my faith today. Right? The Holy Spirit prompts you, and you're, you're supposed to share, and sometimes you share, sometimes you don't. A amen? So crucifixion is personal, meaning the crucifixion is like the bloodiest and the, the most painful, tormenting, excruciating death. This type of death was, was reserved for, it was capital punishment for the worst criminals. So crucifixion is personal, meaning you dying to yourself, it has to be personal and it could no longer be optional. So some of us, the cross is, it's not personal and since it's not personal, it still becomes optional to you in your day-to-day -day life. And picking up your cross is personal, meaning I can't pick up your cross. Pastor Christian can't pick up your cross. Pastor Marco can't pray, pick up your cross. He could pray for you, but you still gotta pick up your cross. Nobody could do this for you. You have to make the choice. You have to settle the score with yourself. You have to look yourself in the mirror and you have to say, enough is enough. I'm tired of struggling with this addiction. I'm tired of practicing addic this addiction. Lord Jesus, I'm willing to die to myself and I'm willing to live for you. <laughs> Crucifixion is painful. Somebody say painful. You think this is going to be easy? A lot of people think it's easy, and that's the problem. You're fooling yourself. This is a slow, agonizing death. This ain't like you just get shot in the head and you're dead. No, this is a slow death. This is a tormenting death. This is an agonizing death. This is not a quick and an easy process. Some of us think, yeah, yeah, I'm going to die to myself. Okay, yeah, the war is going to start. This is slow. This is painful. It's the most agonizing, excruciating death. This is considered the worst way to die. Like when Jesus was hung on the cross, he died in six hours. It took the average person three to five days to die on the cross. So why did Jesus die so quickly? It's because he was practically beaten to death before he was nailed to the cross. And like you really got to think about that. Resurrection Sunday is happening. Like I pray you get rev new revelation of the gospel and the cross. We fool ourselves if we think the habits and the desires of our flesh will die without a struggle. Huh. It's going to be a fight. Somebody say it's going to be a fight. 
Last, last, last P. Crucifixion is pitiless. Somebody say, no mercy. No mercy. When's the last time you had no mercy on your flesh? You take it easy on your flesh. You take it light on your flesh. There's no turning back once this process begins. Meaning, when that nail is nailed on the cross, you couldn't get off the cross. You couldn't negotiate yourself off the, off the cross. You couldn't say, I promise I'll be good. I promise I'll never do this again. No, when that nail is on the cross, there's no turning back. Stop negotiating yourself off the cross. You have to die. We're wrapping it up. Somebody give God some praise. Has anybody seen the movie Titanic? So I actually watched the Titanic for the first time last week. Never watched the Titanic. But the Titanic is, it's an 11-time Oscar Academy Award winner, three-time Golden Globe winner. They got awards for Best Director, Best Music, Best Picture, Best Actor and Actress. And everybody in here, if you've seen the movie, everybody is captivated with the love between Jack and Rose. Jack is Leonardo DiCaprio, Rose is Kate Winslet. And the reason why we identify with their love is because the best form of human love is to risk your life for somebody that you love. And in that movie, you see Rose. She was willing to lay her life down for Jack. And Jack was willing to lay his life down for Rose. So. We're, we were captivated by that love story. But I want to tell everybody today that the greatest form of love was actually in Titanic, and it had nothing to do with Jack and Rose. So there was a, there was a man named John Harper. He was from Scotland. He was an evangelist. He was on board the Titanic as it was sinking. And when you watch the end of the Titanic, it's a pretty sad movie. Everybody's wrestling, everybody's frantic, everybody's panicking. They're just fighting for survival, right? But John Harper, he had a daughter and a niece that he had adopted, and he was also a widower, so he was a caretaker. He had direct access to get on a boat and to save him and his family's life. But John Harper, he decided to let his daughter go and to let his niece go on a boat so that they could be rescued, so that they could be saved because they knew Jesus already. John Harper, as the ship was sinking, as everybody was running around, um, just panicking, he decided to stay behind and to preach the gospel. Let's give God some praise. So let's think about this. He was willing to live his, leave his daughter. He was willing to leave his niece. These were his children. And he stayed behind because he saw through the lens of eternity that there were souls on the ship that would possibly perish. So he stayed behind as the ship was sinking and he preached the gospel of Jesus Christ while the ship was sinking and while everybody else was concerned with saving their life, he was concerned about their eternal life. Let's give God some praise. So he put his young daughter and niece on a lifeboat and he stayed behind to preach the gospel to fearful passengers. As the Titanic was about to sink, he finally jumped into the freezing waters. He did not survive. And being the caretaker of two children, he could have claimed a seat in that lifeboat, but he gave his life to others. He displayed the greatest form of love, just like the scripture that Jesus said, there's no greater love than this than for one to lay down 
his life for his friends. John Harper didn't even know this, these people, but since he saw them through the eyes of Jesus, he considered them friend. He displayed, according to Jesus, the greatest love one can show, laying down one's life for his friends. Eternity will no doubt reveal those who found eternal life because a faithful pastor gave his life for them. In that way, John Harper imitated the sacrifice of Christ who gave his life that we might live. Rare are there occasions when one person is called upon to die so that another might live. When we can demonstrate the greatest love in countless other ways, when we die to our own desires and we choose the good of another over ourselves. Let's give God some praise. Everybody stand up. So it's safe to say that the, that the Titanic, it actually had a greater love story. And I pray that we understand, like in our greatest form of human love, we'll die for our loved ones. But Jesus died for undeserving people that needed a savior. So today I'm gonna make two calls. We have the usher team come up. I mean, this, you know what I, you know, you, you know what I guys, you know what I mean. The altar team. So as everybody's here, I really want us to take a time in this moment. The first call is to preach the gospel. Maybe you're not bold. Maybe you are timid. And guys, in my natural state, like I'm a reserved, quiet person, but I also got the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit won't let me be quiet. So the first call is right now, Drew, I heard your message, preach the gospel, but I struggle in that area, Drew. I'm a little timid, I'm a little shy. I, I'm, I'm still trying to break out of my shell. We're gonna pray for boldness and activation of the Holy Spirit to fill you with that power and that boldness so that you could be a light and you could be a witness and you could start inviting people for Resurrection Sunday, amen? Hey, we all got an unsaved loved one. We all got an unsaved friend. Let's pray that we bring them to Resurrection Sunday. The second call, the gospel message was preached. We all sinned and we all fallen short of the glory of God. And the price for sin is death. That means if you die in your sin, you are gonna experience the judgment of God and the wrath of God. But God loves you so much that he sent his son on your behalf. He saw you when you couldn't help yourself. He saw you when you couldn't even change. So he died on the cross so that you could be forgiven, you could be redeemed, you could be set free, you could be born again, and you could walk in a life of power, authority, and victory. So that's for you. If you wanna, you wanna lay down your life, you wanna give up your life, remember, you gotta crucify this flesh. We can't make it easy anymore. We got to be real. You got to repent. You got to die. You got to deny. And I'm praying that today we choose to pick up our cross and we choose to surrender our life to Jesus. On the count of three, if that's you, raise your hand. If you want boldness, raise your hand. You know you need to walk in that power and authority and you know you haven't been sharing the gospel and you know you need to share it. And number two, you want to give your life to Jesus. You want to surrender your life on the count of three. Don't let nothing stop you from raising your hand. One, two, three. Raise your hand if you want to receive today. I see that hand way in the back. I see that hand way in the back. I see that hand way in the back. Way in the back. Way in the back. I see that hand. I see that hand. I see that hand. Let's give God some praise. Give God some praise. For all those that raised their hand, I want you to make another decision to come up here. And to come up here is going to signify you denying yourself, you picking up your cross, and you making a decision to follow Jesus today. Let's give God some praise as they come up. Praise to God. Praise God. Praise God. We're going to close out in prayer. Everybody lift their hands as a sign of surrender. 
make sure everybody's covered as they're coming up. We got some more people coming up. Let's give them some praise for making a decision. You guys are making a decision to no longer live for yourself. Congratulations, bro. Proud of you. It takes a real man and a real woman of God to live for God and to no longer live for yourself. It's easy to live for yourself. It takes a real man to make this decision today. I'm proud of you, bro. Proud of you, bro. Let's get some, let's get some more altar workers to cover up everybody here. Let's praise God for all the people that came, made this decision today. Praise God for all the people that were willing to step out in faith. And right now, as we pray, I really want you to receive. Everybody raise their hand as a sign of surrender. We got altar workers, lay hands. Everybody say, Father God, in the name of Jesus, I ask you to come into my heart. Be the Lord of my life. I surrender. I surrender. I surrender everything to you, every addiction, every stronghold. I give it to you, every burden. I give it to you, all worry, all anxiety, all fear, all doubt. I give it to you in the name of Jesus. Fill me with your Holy Spirit. Fill me with your boldness. Fill me with your truth. Fill me with your love. Thank you, Jesus, for rescuing me. I put my faith in you, my trust in you, my everything to you. Thank you, Lord, for dying on the cross for my sins so that I could be forgiven. I could be redeemed. I lay down my life for you, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. We all say Amen. Let's give God some praise.